When my research started, I was looking at organisations that were in receipt of public money, which meant that they were receiving funding from regional government, local government, national government and so on. But I think the more that you look into this process of performance measurement, you begin to recognise that really it's a managerial process that applies to all sorts of organisations, whether in the commercial sector, whether in the voluntary sector, whether in the public sector. Uh, and to some extent, certainly in the last 20 years, the extent to which those three types of sectors uh, exist separately uh, has changed. To some extent, those sectors have blurred. So the performance measurement system applies to potentially any organisation in the sector. The method, the, the idea behind the method from the research is that organisations effectively choose what their priorities are. They actually express for themselves what their purposes are. Now for some cultural organisations, innovation is absolutely central to what they're about. It's, it's core to their identity, if you like. Whereas for other organisations, it's, it's less so. They might be performing more in terms of uh, like a community arts organisation, which is to do with social cohesion and the like. So really, innovation is one of the strategic choices that's available. Some of the benefits of this system are to do with clarity. Um, the argument is, is that by being able to define the purpose of your organisation, you're much more able to manage clearly and coherently whether you've been successful in the pursuit of your objectives. Now, going back to the initial starting point of my research, I was trying to look at the ways in which public funding changed what cultural organisations did. So in that respect, we were trying to kind of isolate the specific impacts of funding. And, that, and that, that, that was a very important benefit of this. One of the things we'll find out, because in my research I approached a whole range of types of cultural organisations, theatres, galleries, museums, art centres and so on. Um, they have different priorities. Some of them were um, commercial, if you like. They were expecting people to pay to go in or to you know, experience the cultural experience and so on. Um, others, others were free. And so the... Again, the, the, the point of the, of the matrix, if you like, in my research is that it offers a range of choices. The, the, the general environment for cultural organisations has changed quite significantly. Um, the availability of public resources has changed quite considerably, particularly following the, the financial crash and so on. Um, in Britain, um, cultural organisations actually had a a new source of revenue through the National Lottery. Now a lot of organisations benefited from that for quite a long time. But I would still want to try and kind of defend the basics of the model, because the basics still apply, even though there might be less public money available. You might be looking at organisations now that have kind of changed their character. They're semi-public, semi Voluntary. In, in Britain, the social enterprises is, a, is an important model, for example. So going back to the 1980s, we were faced with the, the early days of cutbacks in public money. So the, and this was one of the reasons why we actually tried to be more specific about what the purposes of public support were. Uh, at the time, some of them were very good at describing what their organisations did, but they weren't necessarily very good at saying what their organisations were for. So they weren't thinking strategically, right? It wasn't really what they were about. Very, very passionate people, very committed to what they're doing in their arts organisations, but their background wasn't in management, they hadn't studied strategic management and so on. So they didn't really think, and some of them didn't really think that way. But it was very varied, very varied. I mean, some of the uh, organisations that I, were pr I was uh, looking at uh, are major organisations, very large, significant players in the cultural sector. 
And th some of the managers of those, very strategic in the way they think about things. One of the benefits is that there should be um, a clarity of why you're actually trying to do what you're trying to do within your organization. I would say that when I first started to do research in this area, um, the professionalization of arts management was, um, if you like, in its infancy perhaps. And in the time since I've done my research, I've been one of the editors of a, of a journal called the International Journal of Arts Management. And the people who run that journal have tried to make the argument that arts management is professionalizing. And they've tried to highlight the growing number of postgraduate courses and programs specifically about arts management. So we do now have Masters of Arts Management, some of which are taught across three, four countries, for example, some of which um, are taught within a particular country and so on. So it may be the case that that's actually changing a little bit. Yeah, and uh, uh, you know, our, that kind of program wasn't available, say, to me in the mid 90s, but it's much more available now. Now, it's a slightly different question as to whether you're better off getting experience in other sectors and bringing it to the arts, or whether you're better off, you know, trying to pursue these particular programs. And I, I don't actually have any evidence to try and sort of argue for or against that. Yeah.